are many reasons why tourism is a great thing. It brings in money, it can help preserve culture and heritage, it's educational. It can help to encourage the preservation of natural areas. However, it is most definitely possible to have too much of a good thing. And that is the case for mass tourism. Mass tourism is a prominent part of the tourism industry. Associated with the traditional package holiday model, well-known holiday resorts and famous tourist attractions, many areas both benefit and suffer at the hands of mass tourism. But what exactly is mass tourism and how does it impact the wider tourism industry? In this video I'm going to answer exactly that. If you are new here my name is Dr Hayley Stainton and I'm here to teach you all about the travel and tourism industry and how to be a better tourist. So what exactly is mass tourism? Well the clue is in the title. Mass tourism is essentially tourism that involves the masses. So what is a mass I hear you ask? Well, that is not exactly clear, but let's just say it's usually a lot. Like, really a lot. Perhaps thousands or tens of thousands or more. Mass tourism can occur in a variety of tourism situations. It could be a coastal resort such as Benidorm. It could be an area that is home to major tourist attractions such as the Great Wall of China. It could be a picturesque village or a remote island. But wherever mass tourism occurs, it relies on the same concept. There are large amounts of tourists, often filling or exceeding capacity, in a given location at any one time. So how did mass tourism evolve? How did we get here? The history of tourism is a long one and mass tourism plays a key role in the growth and development of the tourism industry. The origins of mass tourism can be traced back to 1851, when Thomas Cook led his first organised group of tourists to the Great Exhibition in London. While his business model did change and adapt over the years, the concept remained the same, organised group travel. Over time, more and more people were able to travel. After World War II, people began to have more disposable income and new legislation was brought in to ensure that workers had paid holidays each year. At the same time, destinations become more developed. They developed their transport infrastructure, promoted their destination for tourism and built facilities and amenities that tourists required. Mass tourism notably developed in Western societies since the 1950s. This was the result of a period of strong economic growth. Mass tourism was first seen in Western Europe, North America and Japan, as these countries had strong economies and thus the general public were wealthier overall. Globalisation has also fueled the mass tourism industry. People can find the familiar on their travels. There are less surprises than there once were. We can research our trip on the internet and watch travel shows to familiarise ourselves before we travel. The mass tourism industry really started to boom with the advent of the low-cost carrier. The average UK outbound tourist went from having a one-week holiday per year to taking a big holiday and a couple of short breaks. People who couldn't afford to go on holiday before were now being brought into the tourism market. So how do we decide if tourism is mass tourism or not? Well, there are several identifying characteristics of mass tourism. The first is an extreme concentration of tourists. Each type of tourist destination is different. Some places are big, others are small, which is why we can't put a specific number on it. We can't say if there are 1,000 tourists there, it's mass tourism, because if it's a huge place, that's not a big deal, but if it's a small place, it is. In the context of mass tourism, a destination could be a city, a holiday resort, or the area surrounding a popular tourist attraction. But it's not the size of the destination that matters. The important fact is that there are more tourists that come to the area at a given time than the destination can comfortably cope with. Okay, so that is also another subjective term. What does comfortable mean? Well, what I mean by this is that the tourism has adverse effects as a result of the visitor numbers. It is no longer comfortably coping. This could include environmental degradation, gentrification or adverse social impacts, for example. So, the major characteristic associated with mass tourism is that there are too many tourists in a given area, whether that's a big area or a small one. Another key characteristic of mass tourism is the saturation of a destination. Having too many tourists leads to saturation. If a tourist destination is saturated, there are likely to be more tourists than there are members of the local community. Revenue from tourism-related activities is likely to dominate the economy and there are often negative economic, environmental and social impacts that are associated with this. 
Mass tourism is generally associated with the concept of over-tourism. Over-tourism refers to the issue of having too many visitors in a given time in a given place, which impacts negatively on the tourist experience, on the host community and on the natural environment. Over-tourism is a growing problem that can only be resolved by adopting the principles of sustainable tourism management. Mass tourism is also associated with organised and packaged tourism. Whilst not all mass tourists are packaged tourists, there is definitely a linear relationship between the two. By default, group organised holidays bring large amounts of tourists to a destination at the same time. Whether this is via a coach tour, a day trip or a tour operator, travel in organised groups brings large amounts of tourists together in one place at one time. Group tourism is usually organised in a place because it has some particular value to the tourist. For example, there are many tours to visit the famous Abu Simbel attraction in Aswan in Egypt. Likewise, Sharm El Sheikh is a popular destination for package holidays and enclave tourism. And mass tourism is directly associated with good accessibility. The advent of the low-cost airline largely fueled the growth of the mass tourism industry. Airlines such as EasyJet and Wizz Air put new tourist destinations on the map and helped to transport more tourists to existing tourist destinations than areas could comfortably cope with. Cheap flights has meant that many areas have become saturated with tourism. Cheap flights means that more people can afford to go on holiday more often. But accessibility isn't just about price. The past two decades have seen the number of available flights increase exponentially. This has meant that destinations are more accessible to tourists. Likewise, many destinations have become more accessible because they have developed their transport infrastructure. New airports, new roadways and improved rail infrastructure has meant that more tourists can reach more destinations around the world than ever before. And something else that has really fueled the growth of mass tourism and, and is often a major characteristic is the media and promotion. If we don't know about a place, then we don't go to a place. The media has placed a significant role in the growth of tourism to particular areas. From episodes of Carl Pilkington's Idiot Abroad, to Travel Man starring Richard Ayoade, to Leonardo DiCaprio's famous film The Beach, there are plenty of places that have made their way to fame through the media. However, one of the most notable developments in the promotion of tourist destinations is the development of social media. Have you ever heard of the term Instatourism? If you have, let me know in the comments. Believe it or not, Instatourism is an actual type of tourism. Social media platforms have raised awareness of many tourist destinations around the world that have previously featured only deep in our guidebooks. In particular, Instagram's geotagging function enables social media influencers to display the exact location of where their photographs were taken. This has resulted in tourists flocking to areas around the world that had previously experienced little or no tourism. And mass tourism is often associated with the stage of consolidation. Not sure what I mean? I am referring to Butler's model. Butler, in his Tourism Area Lifecycle model, outlines the way in which a destination grows and evolves. In his model, there is a clear point at which tourist numbers are at their highest. This is the time when tourism is fully developed and is starting to demonstrate some of the negative impacts that are associated with over-tourism. When tourism reaches the stage of consolidation in a destination, it's likely that it is also experiencing the concept of mass tourism. Okay, so we've talked about the characteristics of mass tourism, but what are the types of mass tourism? Enclave tourism. Mass tourism is commonly associated with enclaves. Enclave tourism is essentially tourism that takes place in a space that is segregated from the community outside. It's in its own bubble, so to speak. Enclave tourism implies a conscious decision to segregate tourists from the general population. This is usually in the context of an all-inclusive environment such as a cruise ship, a hotel or a resort complex. Enclaves are enclosed and self-contained physically, socially and economically. This means that tourists have hardly any reasons to leave the enclave. Beach holidays. There are many beach areas where the destinations have become overdeveloped. These are most commonly located in Western Europe, although they are found all over the world. It is these overdeveloped beach areas that are most commonly associated with the mass tourism model. Mass tourism beach holidays have traditionally been the bread and butter for travel agents, especially in Europe. Up until this day, high street travel agents are filled with holiday brochures boasting photo after photo of beautiful beaches and swimming pools. With the lack of British sunshine and seemingly endless rainy days, it's no surprise that Brits, among other nationalities, seek warmer climes. Thomas Cook's products were among the first to provide British holiday makers with a typical sun, sea and sand experience. But there have been many more players enter the market since. Skiing. 
There are many ski resorts that have developed to such a stage that they can now be classified as mass tourism destinations. Popular throughout the winter months, many tourists flock to ski destinations for their holiday. This is especially popular in the Alps in Europe and the Rockies in the USA and Canada. Ski holidays are also often sold as a packaged product by travel agents, composing of flights, transfers, accommodation and ski rental or lessons. Theme parks. Theme parks attract a large amount of tourists. Disneyland in Paris attracts around 15 million tourists each year. And Disneyland in Tokyo has approximately 18 million visitors each year. Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney Florida has more than 20 million visitors each year. Wow, that's a lot of people. People who visit theme parks also often provide a tourism boost for the local areas too. People may choose to eat in nearby restaurants and stay in nearby hotels, for example. Events. Mass tourism frequently occurs when large numbers of people undertake tourism related activities in the same place at the same time and this is often the case with major events. From the Olympics or the Football World Cup to the Day of the Dead Festival in Mexico, events attract tourists all over the world. Mass tourism caused from events can put a strain on local areas, which may not be equipped to deal with the influx of visitors. Major tourist attractions. Many tourists will travel to an area to visit a particular tourist attraction, whether this is a museum in Paris, a war memorial in Washington, or an underground cave in Jeju in South Korea. Tourist attractions are often the main appeal of a tourist destination. Major tourist attractions can attract masses of tourists, who then spend time in the surrounding area, thus making the area a mass tourism destination. Cruise. Cruise tourism is one of the most popular types of tourism. Cruises come in all shapes and sizes, and the smaller ones are obviously not examples of mass tourism. However, some cruise ships are so big that they are the size of a small city. The largest cruise ships in the world have a capacity of more than 5,000 tourists. These tourists will disembark en masse when the ship docks at various locations, causing an influx of tourists to said destinations over a short period of time. Mountain climbing. Mass tourism when climbing a mountain? Surely not. Well, actually, yes. Okay, so you're not getting thousands of tourists like you might on a cruise ship or in a beach resort. But as I explained earlier, mass tourism is not about specific numbers. It is about when the numbers exceed the capacity. Sadly, there have been many stories in recent years of capacity issues when climbing mountains. The most notable stories have been on Mount Everest, where a number of tourists have sadly died as a result of queuing at high altitude. So is there actually anything good about mass tourism? Well, yes, actually. Mass tourism makes money, and that is the number one motivator for all destinations who allow areas to evolve into mass tourism destinations. After all, money's what makes the world go round, right? Mass tourism brings lots of tourists, and lots of tourists spend lots of money. This supports economic growth in the local area, and it enables the destination to spend or reinvest the money that is made in a way that is appropriate for that particular area. Some destinations may build more hotels, others may make financial investments, some may spend more money on public health services or education. Mass tourism creates many jobs, and jobs help to boost the local economy as well as supporting livelihoods. Jobs can be related to tourism directly, for example a person who is employed as a hotel waiter or a holiday representative, or jobs can be related to tourism indirectly, for example the fisherman who catches the fish and supplies it to the hotels. But more often than not, mass tourism is associated with negative impacts of tourism. Mass tourism has gained a pretty bad reputation in recent years. If you google the term mass tourism, you will largely be greeted with articles that discuss the negative impacts on the environment and on the society. Mass tourism creates intense environmental pressures due to the fact that such activity involves a large number of tourists in small areas. The environmental impacts of tourism include aspects such as littering, erosion, the displacement of animals, damage to flora and fauna, and a reduction in air quality, to name but a few. Mass tourism can also cause significant social impacts, gentrification, increases in crime, loss of culture and authenticity, and cultural ignorance are just some of the ways that large amounts of tourists in a given area can negatively affect the local society. The other major problem is economic leakage. Whilst mass tourism creates significant revenue, not all of this money remains in the destination. In fact, 
Because mass tourism is closely associated with all-inclusive holidays and enclave tourism, it experiences more economic leakage than any other area of the tourism industry. Economic leakage is when the money raised leaks out of the area, and it's largely due to multinational chains operating within the tourism system. If you eat McDonald's, a large amount of your money will go back to America. If you buy a can of Coke, most of the money goes back to America. If you stay in a Hilton hotel, well guess where that money's going? I think you get the picture. Ultimately, most people will view mass tourism as a bad thing at large. However, it doesn't have to be that way. We just need to make sure that we plan for tourism in a sustainable way, where we assess all of the options, what the impacts are, how we can mitigate the negative impacts, or minimize them at the very least, and capitalize on the good stuff, making money, sharing cultures, etc. If you have found this video helpful, do me a big favor and give me a thumbs up and watch this one next.